Here's a drug you have done. I know you have, almost all of you. Caffeine. Caffeine, I would venture to say, is the single most used drug in the United States. I want to investigate caffeine as a case study of interfering with normal neur neuron functioning so as to change the way you feel and the way you act. It's a good example because it's legal, it's not very harmful, it's easily accessible, so I have a lot of experience with it. Let's see what it does. I'll start with a question. How is it that a drug could make you feel less tired and more alert? Almost anything that you're going to take a pharmaceutical concoction that is going to alter the way you feel or act is going to influence what goes on in the synapse. You're going to enhance the firing of neurons in some part, or you're going to inhibit the firing. Let's see what goes on here with caffeine. Normally, here's how your nervous system is functioning. It's easy to find. We don't have to just look at humans. It's easy to find organisms that would like to be more alert uh, and better able to function. <laughs> Normally, tastes are coming in, sounds are coming in, sights are coming in. Your body is receiving stimulation from the outside world. It's telling you about where you are, what your situation is like. And you also have other stuff going on. Signals from within your body, thoughts, plans, hopes, dreams, emotions, memories. This is what normally is going on. And the way it goes on is that neurons fire. Action potentials go, neurotransmitters are released, postsynaptic cells bind to the neurotransmitter, they fire or they're inhibited from firing. And all of this firing or not firing is perceived by you in a variety of different ways. You see things, you hear things, you taste things, you remember things, you want things, you're motivated to work for things. It's all related to what's going on in the synapse. That's what your brain is doing all the time. It's evaluating the input, whether it comes from outside or from inside, and then it decides what to do. Should I send signals out now, down axons, that will release at their terminal button a bunch of acetylcholine that will cause muscles to contract, that will cause me to walk away from this situation that I don't like, or turn around and stay, or want to stay but turn around and leave. All these complex interactions are the result of your brain weighing all this information and figuring out what to do. So this is going on right now in your brain. It was going on this morning, it'll go on tonight. Late, late tonight though, you'll go to bed. It won't be going on. All of this, how's that for a fancy trick? I just learned that today. <laughs> Costly, both metabolically and energetically. Every time a neuron is firing, because it's been stimulated by a neurotransmitter that floated across the synaptic cleft, every time a neuron is excited, sodium channels open, Remember, sodium gets ru rushed in, potassium rushes out, action potential starts, so now the message has been conveyed. In order for the cell to reset, you got sodium-potassium pumps, have to reestablish a gradient, that takes energy. The cell has to do a lot of stuff. ATP is used as energy. Well, when the ATP is broken down, there's all this metabolic waste product. Stuff goes on. In particular, a chemical called adenosine is produced. And I think of this as cellular exhaust. It's a byproduct. You don't want to produce it. The greater the metabolic activity in your brain, the more adenosine is produced. And it's released by the, the cells. It floats around congesting things. Let's look at how it congests things. It's going to build up and build up and build up. The more metabolic activity that's going on in your brain and the longer it's been occurring for, the more adenosine is floating around. Here's our diagram of the end of one neuron, a terminal button. Normally, we've got the little purple neurotransmitter diffusing across the synaptic cleft, binding to receptors on a postsynaptic cell, and they cause it to fire. That signal that just got passed might be you thinking about some deep thought to write in a paper 
or a letter to someone or you're creating a really perfect playlist that's going to be the best set of music ever. All of that requires signals to be conveyed from one to the other. But here's what happens. This adenosine that gets released, it's taken up by adenosine receptors that a bunch of neurons within your brain have in their surfaces. Cells have multiple different receptors, and one of them is an adenosine receptor. When adenosine binds to the receptor, some complex chemical reactions go on that wind up with sodium channels opening and it's sodium being able to rush in, but then they remain that way. The sodium just keeps rushing in so you cannot maintain a concentration gradient and the cell can't fire again. So we can think of adenosine as a break on brain activity. The more neurons in your brain that have adenosine bound to adenosine receptors, each time a cell has a bunch of those bound to, that cell can't fire. It's been taken out of action. So as the day goes on, more and more and more of the neurons within your brain don't respond to stimulus. This is why you can be sitting at your desk at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're trying to write a paper, and you can turn the music really loud. You can sit there and you can hit your hand. You can do this. You can pinch yourself to try and stay awake. Those signals, they're not being passed on. They're all filled with adenosine and neurotransmitter gets released and it's like the next cell is saying, nah, I'm too tired. <laughs> What's the response to this when none of your cells are going to fire based on stimulus? You go to sleep because you're tired. And so it's this, this gauge in your body, it's this feedback system that says, you've been up too long, there's been too much activity, the body needs to reset. When you sleep, adenosine finally is taken off the receptors. It's brought back to the other cells. Lots of other stuff goes on. This isn't the only thing that tells you to be tired or not. There are other systems, but it's an important break to neuron activity. So while you sleep, it all gets reabsorbed. When you wake up, you feel refreshed. So we have to get to caffeine. These are coffee beans. They've got plenty of caffeine. Here's what caffeine does. Caffeine masquerades as adenosine. That seems odd, right? You take a pill that masquerades as adenosine, what should the response be? It should be a depressant. It should fill all those receptor sites and now none of your neurons fire and you fall asleep. However, it's not a perfect uh, mimic of adenosine. It's just good enough so that it fits into the site but not good enough to make the subsequent neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, inhibited from firing. So if you can block all those receptor sites with caffeine, less inhibition, less uh, inhibition of these neurons. So you don't inhibit brain activity, all your thoughts get processed, your deep thoughts that will allow you to make that playlist, write that paper, make those plans, do all the things you want to do, they all happen. The adenosine is still there floating around in the synaptic cleft. It's just not doing the thing that it normally would do. So you feel more alert and less tired. Here's something great about caffeine, too, as if this isn't all great enough. You would think, based on what I've said so far, that since it fills in these receptor sites and it makes you uh, more alert, less tired, you would think, okay, I have to remember to consume caffeine before I get tired, because if I get tired, that means adenosine is filling in the receptor sites and the cells are inhibited. Here's the great thing. Caffeine is such a good mimic that it gets to the adenosine receptor site, it bumps out the adenosine, and it fills it in. Caffeine can make you untired. <laughs> That's great. There are some additional effects that caffeine does that I'll tell you about. One of them has to do with athletic performance. Lots of studies have been done showing that it enhances your strength and endurance, but one that was pretty dramatic was this one. Uh, a bunch of bikers had 19.5% more endurance if they consumed caffeine an hour or so before their race. I read a really disturbing thing related to this study was that lots of bike racers take caffeine suppositories so that they can have a gradual kind of time release. I'm not going to say kick in the pants. Uh, <laughs> what else? 
learning. Rodents that are in mazes where they have to learn really complicated mazes, if you measure how long it takes them to really master the maze, they can do it more efficiently when they are given caffeine diluted into their water. Even if later on when they are running the maze, they don't have the caffeine. So it causes learning gains that persist even in the absence of caffeine. All because you're modifying what normally would go on in the synapse, tinkering with it to get a different outcome. So here's our take home message here. And it's a generalized statement about what goes on in the synapse. If you tinker with normal neuron functioning, as drugs do, you can alter the way people feel and the way they function.